<laughs> so you just yeah, that's good. So um <clears throat> so uh earlier at the ten o'clock meditation I, I said we we're practicing yoga and and uh our tradition we define yoga as uh the natural state naljar. So um I wanna talk about the natural state from the standpoint of uh recognizing um our fundamental awareness and natural state of actually, you know, being out on retreat. So <laughs> uh, it's actually helpful to um, do some yoga, a lot of yoga and meditation outside. Um, temples like this started because um, in India, there's uh, a monsoon uh, and uh, the practitioners around the Buddha um, rightfully didn't want to just totally sit in the rain. Kind of hard to even hear anybody when the monsoon's going on. It, the rain is so loud. So I, I think they had to, you know, build something out of bamboo, and probably it wasn't totally satisfactory. But um, we're here sitting inside because of um, once again the natural world, because uh, it, it's raining or snowing or too cold or something. But primarily, um, the Buddhist tradition of yoga was, was and in many places still is practiced uh, outdoors. Um, uh, in in forest settings, but also in, you know, highly mountainous settings. And um, people come together to, to hear talks inside um, and to do ceremonies because uh, it's easier to get everybody inside on a flat surface. But um, many times when people want to do retreat and um, intense practice, they are outside on um, uh, many cases, hilly surfaces. <laughs> so um, a couple of years ago, um, bought uh, 14 acres on a hill overlooking Discovery Bay and the Olympic Mountains, um, which is probably as close to Tibet as I may get in this lifetime. <laughs> and uh, a couple of people have been able to do some yoga. Um, uh, Jack uh, was, I think, here somewhere. Hi, yeah. So uh, it it's looking out on the completely open sky and the expansiveness um it it does it does actually you know um uh is an aid so to speak or we must or is it a compulsion uh, almost in a positive way to return um and recognize the natural state don't don't you think so jack yes <laughs> definitely so, yeah so um the setting does make a difference. There, are, there are times where we have to like um, also sit in a cave and um, be totally internal and do some dark retreat like that. Um, my, um, you know, personal uh, training and as uh, you know, I get up very early, so I generally have at least. Um, you know, three hours before uh, the light comes in, because I, I don't, I sit in, generally sit in the dark. Um, can't have it totally dark in Carmichael. <laughs> you guys will find out this. <laughs> but the neat part about really being out in the country is, yeah, total darkness is also, you know, it's just like really nice. So there's times to be sitting like here we are together. And then there's times to be like sitting in some kind of cave setting, which probably we have to, um, you know, uh, find it home and shut the door, turn off the lights. Um, although um, my friend Lama Gersom um, frequently goes to uh, uh, sit in Milarepa's cave uh, and um, other places that, uh, and, you know, so goes to Sopema and 
Padma Sambhava's many has of course many caves um uh and uh that's that's an important experience too where you're totally internal but um the advantage to sitting outside is that uh you really have to open up there's no way to be uh totally internal so and when we're sitting in this style um outside um you know atta yoga style then you're just you know just like the guru she do statues we see maybe not quite like that but um you're way open right you're not you're not kind of doing you're not doing just shamatha looking down and eyes closed or looking just on the ground right you're just like in and you can't you know you can't help but um uh expand or um the the natural state both internally and externally want to um harmonize right so uh that's why i say if, if you're angry or kind of upset at least the you know you don't always have to do some cognitive therapy thing, <laughs> uh, or abhidharma thing or just be patient things like can you just go outside and look at the sky Has anybody tried that you know like yeah it works doesn't it you know like you have to give it a you have to give it a, a good long look i mean you can't just go out walk out of your office or house and, okay sky then go back in to be mad you know or confused <laughs> but um if possible uh you know like i'm flat like um i've done this a couple of times but not recently um you know going out to like mckinley park bringing a yoga mat and just lying and looking up at the sky um maybe maybe, maybe now they're finished all their um construction work um you know there's kind of nice grass kind of area so you can just roll out a yoga mat and you just look at the sky and the clouds and i mean how can you you know you're the internal and external seemingly internal and external worlds will will want to harmonize and join right <clears throat> so in vajrayana and the tantra approach we we do see the environment of the mandala is really important um so we put a big effort into ex expression colorful or spacious or enlivening and um <clears throat> setting is is really important so at some point well, I'll be building um, some kind of uh, yoga yurt or something up there, and um, but not too much inside. The best thing really is just you just sitting outside and maybe not even on a mat, and um, it's kind of cold, and maybe or it's too warm, and then you notice that um, some ants are kind of crawling around on you would that ruin the meditation <laughs> it's like, so this is important so um many times when we're reading or we're sitting alone in our house or we're in ideal settings we think we are great meditators we are mahasiddhas we're real zogchenpas <laughs> and then you know, then like a spider or ant <laughs> walks across. Yeah, you know, a mosquito, my nemesis, mosquitoes, because I get allergic. Um, or um, I've done many um, uh, retreats uh, on the beach. Um, you know, when I was studying uh, Zogchen with Toji Rimshe, is now in, in Denver, we used to go out to... Um, uh, the beach on the um, Marin headlands. <laughs> um, and you get out there really early and like five in the morning and think, this is great. You know, and you'd be merging with the elements, which is a big part of uh, natural yoga and the wind. And, and then what would happen? No, that was a fun part. No, somebody be driving on the beach or, you know, there's something like that. So uh, 
the yoga of returning to the natural state um, includes like these things called interruptions, you see. Otherwise, we're dwelling on some kind of still idealized state, right? So um, it's entirely, you know, uh, we create this open space, literally and figuratively, so that um, we allow uh, interruptions to occur, okay? And, you know, real beginning shamatha, you don't want to have, you know, you're minimalizing distractions and interruptions, right? You're minimalizing them, right? Because we're thrown off totally. But, um, and advanced practices like chua practice, ati yoga, zogchen practice, um, uh, you know, um, black trauma practice, we're inviting, you know, like, you know, I hope I hope I hope some really annoying people with a huge like picnic basket show up and start throwing frisbee right in front of me. <laughs> you know, because I was just I was just, I knew it. I was just about to get enlightened or you know, you know, stabilize the view. And that, there come those guys, you know, that are ruined it again. It'll be lifetimes, you know. But <laughs> or, you know, so that that's actually you know what what Trung Paramshe would call setting sun vision, right? You're trying to create this absolute ideal state with no interruptions, right? Instead, we we create a very open state, even a somewhat vulnerable state, and then um, uh, from a relative point of view, we invite the interruptions. But absolute point of view, we just see interruptions as natural, right? can't be anything else. That's why we have to do a lot of study. You know, it, people wonder like, why can't I just meditate? And you can, um, but the intellect and the conceptual mind is so strong that um, it can interrupt uh, very profound states. So, you know, there is a lot of value to study. So at least intellectually and even conceptually, we, we have, we have certainty. That's why we study, not because it's interesting, because <laughs> it's not always. But there's like there's absolutely certainty. So if a distraction, um, if an appearance or um, a phenomena is, you know, we have the idea like, okay, that's a distraction. Then actually, you know, there could be an automatic return, you know, but lots of times we need the absolute certainty, like, oh. Of course, that can't be a distraction because it must be this way. It, it must be that um, the natural state is, is just manifesting this way, you see, because we have studied. So even though there's not the complete natural return, you know, um, uh, you know, like we're not always going to be able to just perfectly do Garab Dorji's three points, right? Now it's going to recognize, oh, okay self-liberated, no biggie, you know, but if we do this, if we do the study correctly, then we go, okay, this, I, I got caught for a second by a distraction, thinking that this is, you know, going to be a big problem, or I need to, you know, uh, you know, take care of it aggressively or something, but the study, well, that confidence, like, no, it can't be this way. Just absolute conceptual certainty is, is really valuable. Otherwise, you're totally depending upon um, a flawed experience. So when, you know, when we're combining, you know, the conceptual certainty, realizing it's relative, but still certainty with the uh, deep awareness training, then you have a very profound and stable practice, right? So uh, sometimes people, under, you know, get sectarian, they think, oh, you know, some traditions are more intellectual and some traditions are just meditative. But the real teachers I've studied with from all the traditions, it's always, it's always the same. It's a complete balance of certainty gained through, you know, relative um, and logical world, epistemology and logic and how things must be. So you absolutely have no conceptual doubt. And then you have the actual non-conceptual completely uncontrived experience to join with it, right? Then then it's like unbreakable. Then you, you don't have to kind of go back and forth. 
you know, so, you know, you don't have to be thinking, okay, is the sky blue or not, or, you know, uh, you know it both uh, experientially and intellectually, right? And then there's, there's no wavering. But before that, say there's kind of wavering, isn't there? Like maybe, you know, we, we, we do this. But when um, uh, we go on retreat and we've done uh, uh, enough preliminary study and yogic training, then uh, even when like we're just sitting there and uh, someone, you know, kicks in a chainsaw. It's it's the same expression as like eagle. From a relative point of view, you know, so they're eagles on 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 the property. You know, really incredible. So, um, you know, you, you'd kind of rather see an eagle, right, <laughs> than than somebody like you know, kind of start up. Um, something like that, but from uh, the, the yoga of the natural state, then um, you know the the leaf blower and you know the eagle. Eagles kind of scratchy too. They go <laughs> like that, right? They don't. They're not. They're not. You know, they're not doves, right? So, but then then we see both as natural expression, right? That's difficult. That's. But we so we must go on retreat um, outdoors because then we kind of go okay this is this is great I can't help but open up I have to keep my eyes open um, but I don't think there's anywhere we can go where there's not going to be some kind of relative interruption right people thinking oh I'll go see Geshe Sewan and Ladakh and there won't be any interruptions there I'm not sure but lots of times even in um, some settlements like they'll have music blaring. You know, you'll you'll go to this place and you think, okay, this is great, and like or a restaurant. There'll be a loudspeaker outside blaring. Um, well, particularly in India, like Bollywood music or something, and it's it's a um, sacred site. I don't know <laughs> if you went to one of those. <laughs> yeah, lucky. I was like. You just want to like get your clippers, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, cut the electrical cord, you know. But um, it's part of the, it's part of the display. Now, that's difficult practice, so it's easier to like say, okay, I'm going to meditate and realize the natural state in front of the freeway or something, right? Thinking, okay, I'm going to deal with my distractions. I'm going to sit in front of a, a busy intersection has anybody ever tried that you know you actually try that you know it's like um you know you start getting in this kind of samadhi state thinking this is really great um but that's that's a problem too right because then you start instead of recognizing nature mind you start doing a little merging trance stuff so uh in natural retreats you you want to um be uh not not totally isolated, you see. So <clears throat> um, today, you know, maybe um, sitting at 10 o'clock or something, maybe there were some people talking out in the library, you know, which is kind of okay, you know, because from one point of view, we want to go, okay, I wish they'd just stop talking because there's nothing more distracting than you're meditating. Uh, and someone's talking in another room, right? And from a shamatha point of view, from a relative meditation point of view, of course, you know, like, but if we're doing uh, the yoga that manifests the natural state, then of course it's just um, display, right? It has to be. Besides, we're talking to ourselves anyway, aren't we? I mean, if you're if you're kind of going, I wish those people would shut up in the library. Um, don't they realize we're meditating here? You know, then we've already created, you know, a worse disturbance from our side, haven't we? Or we could they could be talking in the library, and then we kind of go, oh shit, no talk in the library, and then we then we notice that we're having that comment. But um, we can even have a sense of humor about that, right? 
about our own kind of aversion. So um, when we're practicing from the natural state, the path is so wide that um, there's the confidence that you, you can't go off. You see, there's, if we're practicing really diligently every day, then there's a sense that, um, you know, okay, we're, we're irritated. First kind of non-conceptual irritation is yeah, talking, and then we have a dialogue. But then, then as of Chen Post, we can kind of go, this is kind of funny, here I am, you know, you know, getting mad at myself and commenting about them. But then there's a sense of humor behind it. So one of, one of the um, things that we get into is kind of this humorless state. <laughs> uh, and um, that's uh, called, uh, my teacher called it serious disease. <laughs> like that, you know. So sometimes teachers do really interesting things to get us out. Um, I'll just share one from um, my main Zen teacher, Sasaki Roshi. Is like uh, when I was uh, living at uh, the monastery Mount Baldi, is th there's always food trips, you know. So there was arguments about like should it be completely vegetarian or not, or you know, or vegan, you know. <laughs> Even the people didn't use those terms in the 70s, but so much with cheese, you know, and eggs. And so the, this was um, like basically the summer retreat. So about three months long. <clears throat> and we were sitting um, in the Zendo, was, you know, and um, uh, then uh, Roshi's attendant, Anne, who became my first wife, um, ran out of the Zendo and then came back and whispered in the ear of the Jiki Jitsu, who's the meditation leecher, and then said, everyone out to the parking lot. <laughs> We're going, are we on fire? Are we on fire? You know, what's happened? You know, <clears throat> and uh, then... Uh, Roshi's car came out and uh, uh, and said, follow us. And he had a, uh, a Volvo, it's a nice car. And everybody got in the car and we drove down into Claremont. And what do you think we did there? We went to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just ate kind of in silence and then <laughs> drove back and just like crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's taken me about, you know, it took me about at least 20 years to see the humor in the situation, just so you know. I mean, at first it was not humorous, right? Because, you know, we're trying to not, particularly McDonald's, you know, and then breaking and I was like god I, I was just about to answer my koan and then we had to go down and eat McDonald's you know so I'm pointing out that it took me about probably 20 years to see how funny it was <laughs> so we don't and we don't we don't uh always quickly return to the natural state but um if, if we continue to even do the relative practices um but you know, that we have the pointing out uh, instructions with Padesha from a qualified teacher, then we will be able to return because um, it won't go away. It's indestructible. So now it's 1148 and maybe we can have a short discussion or complaints or questions. And I hope this has been somewhat useful. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. No one. Oh, okay, Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Uh, Lama, I have a tendency to, for a long, long time, to look life like a puzzle. 
Mm. And this this keeps my mind always in this habit of trying to solve a problem, whatever, wherever it is. Uh, so the subject may change, but uh, but the presence of mind is always there, even um, when I try to meditate. Anytime, it's like a really bad habit or just a habit. Um, how how do you deal with with this? Is, is any use for the this to be a to see life as a puzzle? Like puzzle trying to fit together pieces or puzzle as some kind of um yes to to keep going. So it's it's something it's some understanding that is missing that we have to to find to to keep going. Yeah, that's true. What? Like a so yeah, she's she's trying to help me with it, like looking for a solution. But it's it's yeah, it's 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 the feeling that there's always some understanding missing that will that will make my life uh, perfect. So that's true. <laughs> but um, frequently, because we um, we we have that, we realize something missing. You know, we see suffering, we see dukkha, and then. Um, but uh, there's like intelligent ways to look and then there's um, difficult ways to look, right? So um, the Dharma and teachers and friends are, are here to um, make it go quicker. You know, they're dead ends for sure. So, you know, we, we're lost in a maze and, you know, they're dead ends. So we do need some kind of pointing out instructions, some basic teachings, some uh, structure, or the chances are we, we won't get out of the maze. So it's right, yeah, something is missing and we, we do need uh, guidance. So that's why we're all here, you know. It's good to recognize like, yeah, there's a problem here. That's the first noble truth. It's a problem. And, you know, how, and to try to kind of like, how do I, you know, get in this maze, right? Hopefully there's like some, you know, like uh, the labyrinth and create this uh, breadcrumbs to get out, right? Or something. <laughs> we, we need, we do need assistance generally to get out. There are Pratyeka Buddha types that seem to, um, that uh, in a totally solo way are um, get out. But the problem is from the, our tradition that Pratyeka Buddhas don't, don't really know how to teach others, right? Like they're geniuses, right? There, there's some people that just seem to spontaneously kind of wake up, um, but they don't always become the best teachers because they don't they don't kind of know how they got there. So full enlightenment in our tradition is not only seeing the nature of awareness and recognizing that totally ourselves, but also um, you know to perfect skillful means. So relative and absolute bodhicitta. Absolute bodhicitta is just the way things are. And relative bodhicitta is, you know, how how to work with different situations. So we, you're correct, you know, there there is some special teaching and life is a puzzle. That's correct viewpoint. You're welcome. Um, so Loma, one of the things that you said was that how our study can help us, uh, when we're trying to do this openness meditation. Um, and I really like study a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I try to do a fair amount of it and I try to do as much meditation as I can. Um, but when you're talking about that, one of the things that I guess, I'm always concerned about with study is how it may narrow our openness and not just direct our openness, but narrow it in a way that may not actually be beneficial if we're not maybe studying the right things or if we're only focused on one sort of study. Um, so how do we avoid that or how is that potentially a pitfall when we're just studying one type of thing or if we're not careful or diligent about what we are actually studying 
how do we how do we avoid that problem of narrowing our openness with our that's a really good question of course you know um the tradition's been uh you know debating that and struggling that from the very beginning you know even before buddha like okay so um because it's, it's easy to do a lot of reading and debating and studying and get conviction, but not real certainty. So uh, in our tradition, we, um, we, you know, even when we're reading the words or the recorded speeches of um, masters, then we, we still need to have a living teacher interpret it because the tendency is to start reifying everything. And, and we, we we get conviction, you know, like we feel it, we feel it, to use California terms, so it must be true. Um, and yeah, it becomes rigid. So the this tons of stories and um particularly in India and Tibet about um, you know, kind of rigid and crazy scholars. And their dramatic interactions, of course, between some uh uh you know, meditators like Milarepa and um, uh, folks like that that are, you know, dealing with folks that have conviction, you know, they, they've done a lot of reading, but they don't have real meditative certainty. But um, the incredible teachers that uh, have lasted um, from, you know, Padma Sambhava to Atisha to, you know, uh, Yeshe Tsogyal and you know, Long Champa and Mipam, Tsongkhapa, of course, you know, always been heavy duty meditators too. So, uh, but my my bias is please don't um, read more than you, uh, you know, do the um, uncontrived yoga. Because the whole point is to reach, um, you know, complete experiential certainty rather than just knowing stuff. So there's no doubt. Um, uh, it's important on a relative nature to know how the relative mind gets screwed up and how the relative mind is liberated, but we also have to um, realize how uh, it's inherently um, pure from the beginning also. And it's important to hear those words because the tendency is we do a lot of scholarship and we think, oh, maybe the mind is not inherently pure. We have to figure out you know, something else. But it's also possible to do a lot of meditation and get slumped, you know, and feel like, oh gosh, my problems are so big and issues never go away and da da da. So study and meditation can work together to reinforce, you know, our confidence and our basic goodness. Um, but um, the uh, Didier Mimche was um, an incredible scholar just in this lifetime and no one doubted his realization right you know likewise present present dalai lama is an incredible scholar and um azok champa too you know and manages to do a lot of activities at the same time like that you know so um i don't think uh it was funny like this is kind of gossipy but kind of interesting so like um, the the sixteenth Karmapa who I met was not deemed to be a great scholar. You know, it's like it was more a meditative kind of person. Uh, I don't know about the present seventeenth Karmapa, but usually a lot of times, um, unfortunately, high level tulkas, um, everybody wants to see them and uh, receive their blessings and do ceremonies and so if they don't have time to study. So, um, you know, my, uh, my teacher, Geshe Yodon, was considered um, uh, by everybody uh, to be like the talk of the 13th Dalai Lama, but he didn't want to be recognized because then he said, you know, you, you, you have to spend all your time doing ceremonies for people and there's no time to study or meditate. Because as you know, it's like if you're uh, recognized in a certain way, you have to give a lot of gifts. So um, our Geshe, Geshe Damsala, of course, is studying now um, at Guto and Dharamsala. 
Um, uh, and so when he goes there, um, uh, he has to, you know, give gifts to all the all the monks there. So we we tried to send him out with at least two dollars for every monk. That's like six hundred. I mean, it's two dollars, but you know, it's symbolic. So if if you show up as a dignitary, they don't help you. If you show up as a tulku, then you're expected to raise all this money, and then you have to distribute it. It's kind of like a Northwest potlatch, you know, and you spend so much of your time, uh, you know, gathering gathering funds to then distribute. And uh, so he didn't want to um, be recognized. <laughs> Milarepa said, "I don't want to don't don't call me a talco because you know then that just it means." It means you can't do it unless you're some divine being. It's just it's basically practice. He wasn't known as a great scholar, but obviously he could debate with the Geshis at the time and had a very keen intellect, right? So meditation doesn't mean that you become kind of meditatively stupid like that. I, I've never met a, a teacher. Um, this includes Zen teachers too and Theravada teachers that were um, strong scholars too. In other words, they could debate and they could rationally explain what they were doing. In our tradition, if you can't explain what you're doing, then um, we don't take you seriously. If you don't know how you got where you are or you can't um, defend your position actually. So the Buddha was asked, you know, in a sophisticated environment. So, you know, he was walking around and said, I'm the Buddha and the people would go, well, good for you, you know, but you're going to have to defend your position. So he had, he had to debate with people a lot. There were not just a bunch of idiots in India at the time. There were also accomplished yogis and rishis and um, people like that. There were not you know lightweight people at all. And he had to justify and explain his position. And one of the reasons that we have all these great teachings is people challenge him. They said, well, okay, that's nice. That's an interesting dharma, but you know we believe this to be the case. So... Why do you think that's the case? So he couldn't just say, you know, like I'm enlightened and, you know, get a book written and get on, you know, YouTube. He had to dialogue just piece by piece with people. So one of the best ways to not get stuck in um, intellectual backwaters is, is to have discussion groups and have study groups where people are talking with each other and, not just saying, well, this is what I think emptiness is, or this is what I think the nature of primordial awareness is, or what's the meaning of kadag or something, you know, but like you have to justify and express your opinion through your experience and, and uh, logic and through authority. So it's um, completely important. We just we just don't recognize people like, great, you're enlightened, you know. <laughs> we have to, well, enlightened to what? So I've had people walk up here and say, they're come up. In the old days, they used to stay here and kind of receive visitors. And sometimes people come up and go, hi. And they go, hi. <laughs> they go, I'm enlightened. <laughs> you know, <laughs> go, good. <laughs> well, what are you enlightened to? And then guess what? Silence. Right? I'm enlightened. Well, what are you enlightened to? And then a follow-up question. Some people know it's like, well, um, who's talking? Who who's enlightened? And what do most people say? Me. There we go. Well, what's it is? You know, it's like it seems like the same old me. I mean, it's not to say really seriously. You know, so you can do better than that, right? And everyone here, we can do better than that, can't we? So you generally don't like um, even with Tibetan teachers will hit you too. So. But um, not just Zen teachers, so you, you don't want to show up to, a, you can't hit people in the United States, it's, it's no much fun anymore, but the, I have been hit, so, you know, it's like, you just don't show up and say, I'm enlightened, and then, uh, you know, so, you know, it's like, I'm enlightened, it's just kind of crazy, so, without having to defend it. So, if you say that, then I'll ask you, like, enlightened to what, and who's enlightened, and I, I want to have something, you know, that, that has some background to it, okay? 
So you can try me, it's okay, you can do that. Yeah. Maybe we have time for one more question or comment. Hi, you need a microphone. <laughs> Hi. So um, in nature, we tend to maybe meditate with our eyes open. Um, how would, do you have any tips for kind of balancing the, the intake and the meditative state and maybe like the observations or sensories that we should take in when we're out there? Uh, I think your question is like, you know, like sometimes we need to be very internal and some have our eyes closed and sometimes wide open like that, something like that. Like what would you recommend when we're out there to get the best, the most out of nature and our meditative state? Ah, uh, the most out of it. I just know that there's a lot in nature that we can look at inwardly and get from, and so I guess what's the the benefit really of of um, nature in your? <clears throat> so. Um... There's a value in being in a place that doesn't always affirm our personal identity, you see. So when we're around people and objects and buildings that we've built, it tends to give us a feedback like, you know, the personal world's the center. So when when we're outside a, a long period of time, um, hopefully we get the idea like we're not, this is not, we don't own this territory, you see, because we're the we're always trying to own stuff. You know, usually we use the term desire or grab it, but you know, this it's it's more than just just grasping. We're trying to own it and make an identity around things like this is my land, this is my space. But the, if one's out a long time, then you realize, well, actually, you know, um, we we don't own it. Right, you know, so it's not so much, you know, eyes closed or eyes open, but really getting the picture like, um, uh, you know, we're we're just here a short period of time. The trees are going to be here a lot longer or the bears or the bobcats or the deer or the eagles are hopefully going to be here longer, that this is their home. We're just kind of partially so... It, it helps to be in a non-human environment to realize we don't own it. And, th and things happen more spontaneously. You know, in the human world, we're always kind of thinking intention and why did they do that? And, you know, why am I having to do that? Where it, the more time we s spend on retreat outside, you know, we realize that um, we're, we're going to get more in natural rhythms. So... That's why, you know, I, I encourage people to, um, you know, participate when Dirk leads, you know, the moon practice with Vajrasattva because we're in Tantra, we're trying to align ourselves with natural rhythms as much as possible to realize like we're, we're, we're going along for the ride. We're not controlling it, right? We're, you know, we're the relative mind, so to speak, is riding on the wind horse. Right, we're not, the wind horse is in control. Yep. Good question. Okay. Last call. Thank you, everybody. Good questions. Good discussion. Right now, do we, do we have some, are we going to have snacks afterwards? Yeah, yeah. I think we're, you know where else can you like you know come meditate, hear good talk, and then have lunch. You know, a lot of places, Dharma centers, you know, like they don't have a kitchen in the West, you know, and and people just have to like go to the restaurants, you know, which is nice, um, or the bars or whatever you're doing. But you know, here we 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 serve people afterwards. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. So let's do closing prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. 
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezing, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Rose Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. So I'll be joining people for lunch and um, we'll be doing a uh, 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 short Kala Chakra sadhana at two o'clock. That'll be fun. <laughs> it's okay to have fun. Um, any other announcements? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'd, I'd like to request um, some friends to help put four tables out for all of us in here. And um, I see your hand, Jack, but I just want to uh, finish this thought. And then in the last group that I was in the meditation, the 10 o'clock meditation, I made an announcement requesting uh, donations. And then um, I uh, afterwards, um, Lamala helped me to remember that, like if we were to visit like uh, where Geshe Sewang's from, Ladakh, uh, it's a really uh, pretty, they don't have a whole lot, but they have um, temples that are um, with Geshe Sewang's leadership and help that are just really, really amazing. And artists have contributed their efforts. And they do this because they're not just thinking of today and Geshe Sewang, if you were around him, he says, it's not uh, this life, it's he's thinking seven lives ahead. And he thinks that way about our place too. So I'm saying all this to just get to the place where if you are able to help us and think of the future, not just us, but the future, uh, we think that we can think just like as you say, Wong, and uh, help make this place a safe and peaceful place for us all and for people that we haven't met yet. And maybe we'll even return here ourselves in our next lives. So um, I know I don't carry cash with me. So we have our website where you can donate to, and that's or become even a member. And then um, I, then Sarah J Foundation, um, this is kind of new news. They're going to come here um, in May and do teachings, um, some monastics, on um, what's called uh, the Bodhisattva way of life. That would be really incredible. So that's just kind of new news. I don't have uh, specifics because we're lining up a translator. So thank you for that. And then uh, uh, in uh, when's, when's Laughter Yoga? Oh, yes. Doug, when's Laughter Yoga? April 30th, yeah, coming up. So April um, 30th. Yeah. So uh, I want to put in a big push for that. Um, it's interesting, like, um, uh, I was studying concurrently at um, Karmazang and uh, Naropa, going down to do, uh, starting to do Zen sessions. Uh, with Suzaki Roshi and Suzaki Roshi came up to um, give a teaching at Naropa and uh, I went with Ovram to Karmatsang so the Trungpa Rinpoche of course and uh, uh, some of the administrators came out you know a little one of these formal awkward teas and uh, uh, maybe it was Reggie Ray or somebody like that kind of stuff I was like Roshi, it's so good to have you here. Um, what what will you be teaching while you're here? And Roshi goes, I didn't come here to teach, you know. And then, of course, he was scheduled to do something, you know. And there was this awkward silence. And then he said, I came pe came here to teach people how to laugh. And he broke out hysterically. Mm. And 
and then a couple of um, times he would say, you know, really the best meditation is you start off the day with some, you know, laughter, laughter yoga, you know, uh, he had a really good sense of humor. Um, some of it slapstick, as um, Trung Firm she did too. <laughs> but uh, it's it's in a, it's it's not just. I don't see the laughter yoga thing as just kind of the, this is a little diversion thing. I think it's it's important, you know, because physiologically you get your diaphragm moving, and you know people are generally a little bit too serious, and you know we need we need to do it. And I'm looking forward to to it. So I'm glad Doug stuck with it, and we've stuck with it. And let's pray for a good warm weather too, right? Yeah. Not too warm, not too cold. The middle way, yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Omo Om Arayapatana. <laughs>